Hi again everyone, welcome back to another Alan Holdsworth lesson video and today I'm going to do the song that was the second highest requested one on the uh, poll that I put up about a month or so ago in the Unreal Alan Holdsworth Facebook group and if you're not uh, a part of that I strongly suggest you do because it's an awesome uh, little group. So we're going to do the unmerry go round and at first I didn't know if I wanted to do the whole song or not but I think it's actually not that bad. The only problem with the song is there's a lot of like effects and stuff that you really need to use in order to make it sound the same. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it into two parts. I'm going to talk about all those parts in this video and then what I think most people want to see is the really awesome middle section. This also, this song is really good because it'll talk about different ways of viewing chords and how Alan thinks of chords and that's really important because Alan does not think of chords in a traditional way. So naming them or trying to, to call them in a different way, it's really almost interpretive at this point. You'll see when I talk about, there's one specific, specific section and I'll talk about that in this video and really that will come into play in the next video. So here it is, the Unmerry Go Round. So, I decided to do this song in multiple parts. I'm going to sort of do them section by section because there's a lot of parts in this song that repeat almost identically, just there's a solo over them or they just come back again. So this song is not going to be really too bad. But I'm going to talk about all the individual sections. And I sort of think of this song having like maybe six parts. There's the intro part with the, uh, the, the cool staccato guitar. There's uh, the, chord, the chordal solo section. Um, then there's that weird harmonized section a drum solo, the really cool middle part of it, and uh, the swell section. And the swell section and um, the cool middle part I'm going to do in the next video. So this will really just concentrate on everything else. Of course, minus the drum solo because uh, I'm not a drummer. So the first part, the intro of the song, actually starts out, uh, interestingly enough, with a delay. Now, maybe about a year or so ago, I had asked on the Alan Holsworth Facebook group, What's going on here? Because it's this really cool kind of guitar part. And I thought Alan was actually playing notes and then stringing them together because it's really difficult to play if you try to play all the notes. And he's not an alternate picker and picking up and down. Uh, and the dummy that I am didn't realize after people had told me that it's actually delay. And once I figured it out, it's actually, yeah, it's 100% right. The uh, book, Reaching for the Uncommon Chord, actually has this section correct but it has all the notes in it, uh, which actually makes it tougher because Alan's only playing basically every other note. Uh, and then there's also a chordal part underneath that. So I'm going to talk about that section. This part comes back in a couple of different ways. So for this section, right now, I just have my regular guitar sound, but it uses a delay that comes just one delay. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it pings one uh, note afterwards. And that's it. So the feedback is, I guess, uh, zero. And uh, what Alan's doing is sort of playing in between these notes. So the I have it set to uh, 300 milliseconds. But the actual way that the delay is working, if you're working with a, a, a metronome or something that actually can do um, notation, is uh, it's a dotted quarter is the delay. And Alan's playing eighth notes. So the notes that are being delayed are going to be in between what's actually being played. So I'm going to actually take the delay off now and just play how that part is normally. So the whole part is really F minor pentatonic. But it's not obviously just like that, but it's very scalar. So every part, it's, I think of this part as like an A, B, A, C, A, B, A, D section. So there's an A section, a B, a C, and a D, and that's sort of how they repeat. So the A section, all these sections start off with just an F. And then you're playing from the flat 7, the E flat, and then you're moving up and down the scale. So the first A section is, that's all it is. The B section starts the same way, F with the E flat, but now you move all the way up to the perfect fourth of the, um, of the uh, 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 pentatonic scale. It's the B section, and then it goes back to the A section. And then we have the C section where you go all the way up to... Uh, the C note, or the fifth of the pentatonic scale, which also
also makes the measure longer. I think that's in 5-4 time. Back to the A section. B section. A section. And then really the last sections you move all the way up to the high F. That's really it. There's one little small section in there in the middle. I'm not going to talk about how all the parts sort of go through. That's actually how the parts uh, repeat when it appears later in the song. But there is a chromatic part where Alan's playing like the um, the B section, but then plays chromatically down to an E. And then just repeats again. I'm not sure why that's in there, and it only appears in the intro section. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to include the delay, and I'm going to try my best to kind of try to play it. Uh, another important tip is if you're trying to use this with a, a delay, Try to keep the notes as short or staccato as possible, or even heavily palm mute all the notes, so it sounds like different notes being played and you're not blending the notes together. So this could be a little tricky because I'm not set to a, a, a tempo, I'm just sort of feeling it, so I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to play A, B, A, C, A, B, A, D section. What it sounds like with the delay in the middle. And that weird uh, chromatic section sounds like this. And then back again. So as you can see, if I keep the, the, the notes as staccato as possible, you get that really cool weaving effect. So, yeah, it's really cool. It's actually fun to do once you get uh, the hang of it, because you can actually do anything in there and it sounds really cool. So, that part happens a few times, uh, just like that, the A, B, A, C, A, B, A, D section. I think that also repeats uh, twice. It's pretty obvious to hear, and even if you use the Reaching for the Uncommon chord book, it's all right. You basically have to re remove, like, every other note that's being played, because every other note is basically the slapback delay that you're, that you're getting. So, that's that part, and now I'm going to talk about the swell section. Now for the swell section, we're going to go right into why trying to name some of Alan's chords are a little strange because they're not conventional. So, uh, I have a little delay thing here and it's also with, a, I think, a, a volume pedal, but I'm not going to use that. I'm just sort of going to play the chords and talk about what they are. So the first chord, to me, I think of this as a F sharp sus2 chord and then the top note is a sharp 11. And what's happening is Alan's really playing this F sharp sus2 chord and he's moving this top note around and that top note is affecting the chord differently. So here it's the sharp 4, sharp 4 to the major 3rd. And this now becomes like an F sharp major add 9. But now what's weird about this chord is here it's an F sharp with a sharp 11, F sharp sus2 with a sharp 11, and if I move it here, it's a major and 9, the major 3rd. But now what if I move it here? Then I have a root, a 5th, a sus2, and a sus4. And that's really not a normal chord name. I don't think I've ever seen a F sharp sus2 sus4 chord. It doesn't exist because we don't we, we name these chords in a traditional way, and this is not a traditional chord. Uh, another way that you can view this kind of chord is you can think of the sus2 as part of a sus4 chord, but like this. So you can think of this as C sharp sus2, I'm sorry, sus4. And then when you add this note here, it's the flat 7. So even though we kept the same interval structure because of the way that we named the chords, we have to name it differently because the sus2 sus4 isn't really a chord name, but uh, 7 sus4 is. So that's why this part, usually with Allen sections, you want to keep the interval stack the same because that's kind of how he's thinking about it but because it's not following traditional harmonic rules or uh, the way that we name chords sometimes you have to jump the note around a little bit in order to get a actual name for it so anyway that section F sharp sus2 add uh, sharp 11 to the add 9 major add 9 does it again then you play the C sharp on top which is still your sus2 Sharp 11 to the uh, add sharp 11, I'm sorry, the add 9. And then play this chord, E flat 
sus2, sus4, or you can think of it as uh, B flat, sus4, uh, with the flat 7, 7 sus4. Uh, and then in the beginning, you get this little section. Alan's playing a C sharp major to a, a B flat minor to a C minor. But I don't know if he's using a slap back delay because it's very fast. I'm pretty sure he's using a delay. And around when he's playing this part of the song, that's where you have the uh, that little chromatic part in there. Now, like I said, that only happens at the beginning. Even this, even the swell section happens at the very, very end of the song. It happens at the beginning, at the end. But at the end, you don't have the you don't have the uh, staccato guitar part. It's just the chords, and it's changed around a little bit. You don't have this section. So anyway, we have uh, I'll play that what we have right now again. And then from here, you almost do something very similar, but now you're at C sharp sus two, and then they add sharp eleven to the. Uh, <laughs> to the add nine, yeah, weird one, the sus uh, two, the sharp eleven, major third, sharp eleven, sus two, and now here you jump all the way to a C, so this is a C sharp major seven sus two, and then you play this chord, which once again, you can think of as like a F uh, sus two sus four, or a um, C, uh, C seven sus four. So like I said, it's got plenty of different names depending on how you view it. One makes sense harmonically, the other one uh, makes sense intervallically, but there's no real name for it. Then after that you have this weird sort of swell section, it's hard to hear, but it sounds like uh, Alan's playing this uh, 9 sus 4. Something like that, and it's, it's all that delay is bleeding through and it's really tough to hear. Uh, you can also play that all the way up here just by playing this. As you can see, it's all the same, but it's kind of hard to reach up there. So this you can think of as a uh, F9 sus4, E flat 9 sus4, uh, D flat 9 sus4, uh, B9 sus4, or you can think of it as E flat major with the 9 in the bass. And this is important because we're going to see this in the next part. So if you want to, you can think of this as a E flat major add 9. D flat major and nine, like that. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. This is an F nine sus four E flat D flat. I don't know if I mentioned that before. Uh, if I got the the uh, root wrong, but yeah, F nine sus four E flat nine sus four. Oh, there you got it right. It's tough. I just do these off the top of my head, and sometimes I just forget what I just that I was talking about because there's so many different names you can call these things that I lose track of uh, what I had called them. But it depends. Whatever you think the name should be is what it is. It's not important as what scale it belongs to. Uh, for me, I actually think it's easier to think of them as a E flat with the 9 in the bass. And as you'll see in this next section, why? So that's the intro section. Uh, and that swell part also happens at the very end the same way, but there's a little twist at the end. So everything the same. Of course, that little triad section isn't there. And now the last chord of the whole song has this, but there's extra stuff underneath. The book has it right, they have a D in there, but they have some weird fingering for it. I actually think the solution is simpler than that. I think Alan's actually put just that chord in drop D, and it sounds like this. So I actually think for that chord, he's tuned down to drop D, and then playing that. So he's got that same F sus2 sus4, or the um, C7 um, sus4 chord with a D and an A. And if you treat D as your root, then you have a D minor 11. You have your D minor 11 here with the flat 13. Once again, whatever you want to call it, but that's what it sounds like. So that's the very final chord of the song. All right, so that section done. Now we'll go to the next section, the sort of uh, improv section, I guess.
So this part of the song gets repeated three different times. There's one part with a written out melody that comes right after the part that we just did. Uh, then Alan takes a solo later, and then finally, I believe Alan Pasqua takes a solo at the very end. So once this, that, this part starts, the bass is really playing a low D as a, as a pedal tone. And I don't know if Alan's really swelling this with the volume pull or not, but there's a high D being played, and then a C sharp, and that sort of creates the ambiance of the song, at least for this part, I should say. So now, to understand these chords, I want to talk to you about how Alan thinks of chords. Once again, he does not think of chords in a traditional way. He thinks of notes as part of a scale, and will choose his own sort of unique voicing, and can play that diatonically up and down. So the first chord here looks like this, and then the second one looks like this, okay? So what I see for this first chord is a B minor, but now with the, instead of B being your lowest note, you have a 9 there. Once again, you can't really, the 9 should technically be above the octave, but because you're rearranging these notes in a different way, with different voicings, uh, you have to really throw those traditional names out the window. I like to pick the name that makes the, that's like the shortest name that makes the most sense, even if it sometimes doesn't make harmonic sense. Sometimes it's very obvious harmonically it's this particular chord and can be named different ways, but for me, I like to think of all these, well, at least all the chords I'm going to play uh, as sort of the same interval group and not to jump around and say, well, it's this chord here, but in this one it's different because the root has changed. I try to keep them all as similar as possible to keep that interval stack. So Alan's really just playing this minor chord with the 9 in the bass. And just to illustrate that point, let's take that concept and play it in C major. So I'm going to play these chords diatonically in C. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play the major triad with the 9 in the bass. So the first chord would be a C major with the 9 in the bass, so C major add 9. The next chord would be D minor, but with the 9 in the bass, so this would be a D minor add 9. And then for the next one you have an E minor, but now you don't have a, uh, you don't have a, a, a regular 9, a major 9, because it would have a uh, F sharp, and it would be F, a flat 9. So this would be an E minor add flat 9 doesn't sound like it, but we're keeping that inter interval structure the same throughout. Then after that we have an F major with a G in the bass, F major add 9. We move that up a whole step, G major add 9, it's like a 9 in the bass. After that, A minor add 9. Then we would have a B diminished with the flat 9 in the bass, the C, which looks like the chord that we had before and then finally back to C major with the 9 in the bass. So all of these chords in this section I believe are built from that. There's a little bit of, uh, of a transposition going on, he transposes a little bit, but all the chords make sense with that interval voicing. Once again, we can't, we have to throw sort of traditional names out the window. This is pretty much what I had written in my book about how Alan thinks of chords. You can't really go by, you're taking a non-traditional interval structure or chord idea and then trying to name it with a traditional name. It doesn't really work. You have to sort of bend it to your will. The way that I had described it is like sometimes in, in like Japanese there might be a word that makes sense in Japanese but there's no perfect English word for it. It's kind of like that in a way. So we have to sort of bend those traditional names uh, a little bit in order to get something that will make sense. So using that you could think of this chord as a B minor add 9 with the 9 in the bass, and then a C sharp diminished with the flat 9 in the bass. Alternatively, if you want to think of this chord, you can think of it as a, uh, like a, a dominant 7, like a, an 11 chord without the root. I would think of it as like an A7 without the root. Uh, sorry, A11 without the root. Uh, that's if you want to use it in a different context. In this context, it makes sense to me as a diminished with the flat 9 in the bass. So, B minor. Uh, add 9 to C sharp, uh, diminish with the flat 9, then that happens again, and then Alan then transposes to a D minor with the 9 of the bass. Then from here he plays that D minor add 9 to E minor with the flat 9 of the bass. And then finally, I don't know how he grabs this, it's all the way up here, you play that first chord, you get the B minor with the add 9, 
and then G major and 9 with the 9 on the bottom, and then A major. So this is almost purely diet. It starts out diatonic to C uh, to D major, and then it dip, dips into a C major. So this would be like your sixth chord to your seventh chord, six to seven, and then sort of like the two chord of C major, and then your three chord of C major, and now you're back to your sixth chord of D uh, major, your four and your five. And Al's got that little line. Uh, I'm gonna try to figure it out. Uh, What's interesting, Alan's actually playing a D while he's playing this uh, A major with the add 9. So you've got like this kind of thing going on. If I could even grab this. So it's almost like you have a, an A major at 11, but then you have the B in there. Very cool stuff. I like this uh, a lot, but once again, naming it's pretty difficult. So that's really just the chord section that's going on through there with that D pedal working throughout. And it works for pretty much all the chords. And that's what happens when Alan solos and Alan Pasqua solos uh, later. Uh, so I'll play that part again. tough to play up here you can alternatively just move the chord down to the next group of strings and if you look we've got that same chord as we did before that major with the add nine on the bottom but now it's a little bit physically easier to play so that's just that whole section and they both improvise over it so the next section I'm going to talk about is probably my least favorite thing that Alan's ever written and uh, you actually need a harmonizer so I'm going to talk about that yeah. Alright, so I just said this section is not necessarily my uh, favorite little part of it, but uh, it's interesting because it precedes my favorite part, which is what I'm going to do in the next video on. So this section uses a harmonizer, uh, a perfect f fourth up. Now the book actually is pretty accurate on this, but it puts sort of all the notes together. Uh, but it's sort of missing some little 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 parts in there, but surprisingly it's, it's uh, accurate. So the harmonizer is actually a fourth up. Actually, I can just turn it on right now. You can hear it. I'm going to turn it off now. For whatever reason, this particular album from Metal Fatigue, uh, there's a lot of harmonizer on it. Metal Fatigue has a part where Alan's playing a, a whole step, and then I think all the all the clean guitar parts are I think a perfect fifth up or a perfect fourth up I can't I don't remember off the top of my head Panic Station uses a harmonizer a perfect fifth up uh, Devil Take the Hindmost uses a harmonizer a perfect fourth down I think and this one uses a, a fourth up so I'm not going to really uh, go too crazy with the names of the chords because it's going to be really tough trying to name them with all the the, the perfect fourth up part as well uh, so I'm just going to try to name them as closely as possible with just uh, what Alan's playing. So first I'm going to do it without the harmonizer and then I'll turn the harmonizer on and, and uh, you'll be able to hear it. So first starts out with this E, my, uh, e power chord thing and then it goes to D and then back to E. And then you sort of go, you go back to D, D power chord, and then you take the, the top note and you go from D to C sharp to D again. Something like that. And then you play a B, and then a D. Then you repeat that again. Now you just play these notes, D, C sharp, and A. Now here, and this is what I was surprised that the book got accurate, because this is actually uh, pretty difficult to hear. First, Alan's sort of playing this diminished, E flat diminished uh, triad here. But then you're pinning the A on top, and you're moving the bottom two notes up a uh, um, uh, half step each time, this major th uh, minor third interval. So you have an E flat diminished here, then you have this, which is, I guess, like a, I don't know, D, 9, sus 4. You have an E, and G, and an A here, or like some sort of E minor 11. But 
then you move that minor third up a half step, and now you have an F, G sharp, and A, which is really weird, and then that goes back down a half step. So that minor third is going from E flat to E to F to E again, all while you're holding that A on top. Then you go back to E flat, you move that minor third down a half step, now you have a D minor. Then you go to here, which is an A minor, and then A augmented. Now you have, go to G minor, then you move that chord up a little bit, and then you have that, that weird uh, A sus2 sus4 chord, or you can think of it as a E7 sus4, and then C minor, and then to B flat minor. So that's what that whole section sounds like, and then it repeats almost identically except for the very end. Repeats again. Goes to uh, C minor, but then it plays that that sus two sus four again. Uh, you can think once well, again uh, D sus two sus four or um, A seven sus four, and then finally D minor if your fingers can reach. I don't even know how Alan can get up there. This guitar is twenty five uh, has a twenty five inch scale. Uh, it'll probably be easier on a Fender style twenty five and a half, but that's what's going on there. So now I'm gonna turn on the harmonizer. Which I said is a perfect fourth up. Now I'm going to play the whole thing. Yeah, the only bad thing about this Kemper is that for whatever reason the harmonizer doesn't work that great. Uh, at least when you're playing multiple uh, notes at the same time, it sounds like it delays it a little bit. I don't know why that happens sometimes. Hopefully they'll be able to fix that. Uh, that part comes back later in the song. It repeats the same exact way. Uh, it's the second to last part and then the end part which is just the swell chords that I, I just talked about. And believe it or not, that's it. There's only those real three sections. Um, also, it uh, just dawned on me when I was talking about this part, I figured I might as well add this in. Uh, this section, the, the section I just did. Once it goes to this D minor, and you still have that C sharp being played, it actually is more like a D, melo uh, D melodic minor, even over this, because you have an E minor with the flat, uh, the flat nine, but also the C sharp, which is like Dorian flat two, which is a second degree of uh, melodic minor, or D melodic minor. So I think instead of thinking of it as C major, it's probably better to think of it as D melodic minor just for that little bit. So uh, but D major, D major, D melodic minor, D melodic minor, and then finally for the final chords, you get back to D major again. So it just dawned on me now. Sometimes as I'm talking about these things, I forget those little details. I forgot the C sharp is actually being played behind it. So that's really what it's uh, implying. So that's it. As I said, those are all the, the sections. The actual deeper chordal part I'll talk about in the next video. Um, that I could get more in depth with the way that Alan thinks of chords and why naming them is so difficult because you can think of them in multiple ways. But then when you'll get to some chords that don't make any sense uh, like name wise when you try to keep that interval structure the same so uh, you'll be able to see and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about harmony and stuff like that so anyway if you got any questions or comments on this video just uh, let me know uh, I'll be able to help out as much as possible and uh, thanks a lot for joining me and I'll, I'll see you guys next time